Stay more comfortable, more concealed, and in the stand longer with Osseo gear. Premium camouflage apparel created for bow hunters by bow hunters. Osseo's revolutionary patented camo patterns and innovative features are designed to keep whitetail bow hunters totally invisible and dead quiet. Elevate your game with Osseo. Visit asiogear.com and take 20% off your purchase with code TRUTH20. Mobile hunters, our buddies over at Tethered are always innovating to keep us more mobile and in the game when it counts. From the Tethered One Sticks, the Fast Pack, to the Ultra Lock Saddle, Tethered is always designing to increase comfort and utility while reducing bulk, weight, and fiddle factor of mobile hunting gear. And now, they've outdone themselves yet again by creating the Carbon Fiber Forged Predator CFX Platform, the lightest fully featured mobile saddle platform that raises the bar for what's possible in mobile hunting gear. Whether you're new to saddle hunting or an old tree climbing veteran, go to tetherednation.com for all your saddle hunting gear. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today I go to my buddy, Mr. Jacob Sklenner, and I got it right. I'm glad I asked you how you pronounced it before we started. That way it didn't sound like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good, man. Nice, man. How you doing, buddy? I know you just got out of the woods. Well, for, first, let me say I'm I'm super stoked to have you on. We've been talking via Instagram and then text for I don't know how long. And it actually started over uh, over wrestling is actually how our conversation started, um, which is funny because I like a lot of, you know, I know you, you're you big into wrestling, you know, wrestled, Mario did as well, you know, and and, uh, and that was kind of, I mean, I knew Mario prior to, you know, um, having him on the podcast, but I didn't know that he was like big into wrestling until he came on. And then we kind of got to talk about that. And so now he and I's text messages, I would say it's probably like 70, 30, like 30% of it's hunting and 70% of it's probably wrestling oriented <laughs> during the it's course funny. of a year. So, uh, I'm glad to have on a, uh, another wrestling, uh, another wrestling and hunting brother, man. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very, very happy to be on. And I think that you find that a lot in the hunting industry It's just mm -hmm. like wrestlers or people that do some discipline in martial arts typically <laughs> are the ones that like are really at times bullheaded and just hardworking and can deal with a lot of suck. And mm -hmm. I think those are some good attributes to someone that may be successful in the deer woods. Yeah. Dealing with a lot of suck, especially when you're in high pressured States, it's, it's like 90% suck and 10% good. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> if I were to put percentages on it, man. But, uh, before we jump into like all the, all the hunting stuff, I do have to ask you how stoked are cause people that are listening, if you're into wrestling, we're recording this right before the NCAA, national tournament kicks off um so how are you feeling about the uh how are you feeling about the tournament what are you most stoked about i am really stoked i mean so coming from the area i'm in in wisconsin the first like askin wrestling academy location opened up 20 minutes from my house and so since askin wrestling academy opened i attended it and it was just amazing because you would see guys that would just start wrestling and now like a lot of the buddies that i started scrapping with are Division one wrestlers, division one mm -hmm. national qualifiers and champions. And like I wrestled like Parker Keeson, who's probably gonna win like mm -hmm. a national title this year. Like yeah. think three time third place winner. Mm -hmm. I've wrestled him like eight times. Like yeah. and and I haven't lost to him. It was all in youth. So <laughs> but <laughs> and I was in his bracket at state that he won. Um and I, I obviously didn't get to wrestle him there, but um but it's so cool, like just growing up around these guys and i'm really hyped for the 165 bracket honestly and oh, i know we've talked about this both. a lot yeah you being a big penn state fan um yeah but but uh yeah keegan o'toole like wrestled with him i remember when the first day he came into awa and stuff and really really hard worker obviously returning national champ two-time national champ like <laughs> he's you know a formidable opponent and the guy that he wrestles with all the time in the heartland room mitchell mesenbrink and I remember, like, when I first went into AWA, Mitchell was, like, a really young kid. We would stay after practice and play football and stuff and listen to music and, like, like just hang out. And it's just kind of crazy to see those guys obviously put a lot more time into wrestling than I did and deserve all the success they're having and now being elevated on the stage. And they actually have a teammate, uh, Noah Mulvaney, that mm. is in that bracket as well, the junkyard dog, we call him. Uh, <laughs> but Noah... So Noah Keegan and Mitchell are all from Arrowhead High School. Wow! So there's three people in the national 
that championship bracket at 165 from the same high school in Wisconsin. Wow, that's is, a great high school, then, man. I mean, that must have yeah. been a powerhouse, dude. Yeah, that's where um, that's where Ben came from, and honestly, I think it was kind of Ben coming from there, and then when um, John Mesenbrink, which is Mitchell's dad, was the coach there, like they were fantastic. Right now, their coach is Randy Farrell, and he's a fantastic guy. He coached the national team for a while um, when I was on it for Wisconsin. And, um, you know, they got a pretty good litany of great coaches there. And um, John Mesenbrink was just as essential to starting Ask and Wrestling mm-hmm. Academy as, as Ben was. And even, you know, Keegan will tell you that he looks up to John like crazy. Yeah, and, I saw, I just really saw an cool. interview. I just saw an interview with Keegan where he, he had mentioned that because they asked him about like the potential matchup of he and Messenbrink or whatever. And, and he basically said, he's like, look, he's like, his dad was my coach. You know, he was like a lot of respect for that guy. He's like, I owe a lot of what I have done to the foundation that he helped build or whatever. You know, so I thought that was cool. It's like he recognizes where he comes from. And I think that's what I appreciate partially the most about wrestling. And it kind of like feels like hunting somewhat to me is that the good ones always kind of appreciate where they come from. They don't think that they've built it on their own, right? So whether it's like O'Toole or Messenbrink or, you know, uh, Aaron Brooks or whoever from a wrestling standpoint, they always kind of go back to that high school and sometimes even youth coach that was like foundational and them kind of either getting the passion or really kind of increasing their their skill set or whatever. And hunting's the same way. It's like for me, if someone asks me like how, how like I've kind of molded like how my approach, I'm like, it's really kind of a mix of like, like Dan Enfault, you know, and a little bit of like Eddie Claypool, maybe, you know, maybe sprinkle with a little Jared Scheffler in there, you know, like I was like, that's kind of, you know, I've, all those guys have played a role in like how I've kind of evolved over time. And I think that's one of the reasons that's another kind of connection point of like wrestling or martial arts or whatever. It's like, there's a lineage that you usually put pl- that you usually play, pay homage to. Right. Like you always kind of remember it, like who was the first person that kind of showed you like some of the right stuff to do that kind of set you on your path. And then who was instrumental in kind of helping you tweak it along the way. It's like, you, you know, if you're um, I don't want to say humble, but like if you just recognize that those people put time into you and gave you something that was of value, then, you know, most people always kind of say like, yeah, oh, yeah, like, you know, I. I do X, Y, and Z because I learned it from these three guys. You know what I mean? When it sound, it feels very much the same way. Like where wrestling, it's like those guys always kind of know where their foundation was built and know that they wouldn't get to where they are. You know, being a national qualifier or a national champ or whatever the case is, without those people, essentially. Yeah, and it's it's really interesting because like I often compare Dan Infault to Ben Askren, and like That's awesome. Dan was a was a pioneer in the hunting industry as far as his approach to bed hunting. And there's plenty of other guys that talk about it and stuff like that, but but as far as giving you quality content and explaining it and teaching it, like Dan, as many, many people have said before me and as many people will continue to say, was a revolutionary in his aspect mm-hmm. of hunting. You know, and that's not to say he's the best hunter out there, but he was incredibly good and still is incredibly good at his niche and has done it over and over and over again in multiple different situations and states. Mm-hmm. And and that's just irrefutable. And now Ben his funky style, Ben Funky Askren, like his, mm-hmm. his way of, and, and this is even more remarkable too. I'll get, I'll get to something even crazier about Ben in my opinion, but he is fantastic at his positional awareness and just, just not letting a guy score. He would intentionally mm-hmm. let guys shoot on him so that he could score off a defense, just doing crazy stuff that people had never seen before. And like mm-hmm. something that comes to mind, I don't know how much you've probably seen, but when he was at beat the streets in New York and freestyle, if you expose your shoulder blades at any point in time, like you're giving up points, mm-hmm. this guy picked up his leg in the air and he did a headstand and basically <laughs> ankle picked upside down the guy and scored on him. And so like, mm-hmm. that's just a wild move that people started yeah. to replicate, but it's like, you know, who, who thinks to do that? Yeah. And then yeah. What really gets me about him and in, in the way that I most relate him to Dan is he's a fantastic teacher. Like he's mm-hmm. a, incredible coach and he just teaches you how to do these insanely complex things that you'd think would be purely instinctual by breaking everything down into a series and i think what i've taken from both ben and dan is if you can take a problem and break it down into a process and you can go through that process and master each step then you can be successful in many 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 different situations 
mm-hmm. then apply it to a lot of different skills where, you know, maybe someone's a better rut hunter or maybe someone's like this. Well, if you can define what you need and then learn as much as possible about that and master each area that you need to conquer in order to get a kill, then you can apply that across the board in many different situations and states. Right. Dude, that's a hundred percent. It's funny you, you mentioned it that way because just talking to some, some of the buddies at, at the gym, you know, they've kind of, they've said to me like, yeah, you, you pick things up quick. Like I only need to see it like maybe once or twice. And like, and if it fits in into like my, my game and it's, and it works well for like my body type or whatever, it's like, usually I can start to like implement it into roles. It doesn't, doesn't mean it's like I'm super proficient at it, but it's like, I can get to those spots, you know? And we were just kind of talking about it one day and, you know, a couple of the guys that I train with, like they hunt too. And so they started talking to me about hunting and like one of them is, you know, more advanced. He's, couple striped purple belt right and we're kind of talking about it and and he's a hunter and so we were talking about hunting and i was breaking some stuff down for him and he was like damn dude he's like i would have never thought of that and he paused for like a second and he was like he's like it makes sense now he's like because he's like the way you hunt is taking things apart stepwise he's like it's never just like i'm jumping in and doing whatever he's like there's always like this stepwise plan approach that you have he's like and it translates into like how you learn jujitsu. You know what I mean? It's like, you yeah. don't learn it. Like here's the move. It's like, you learn, put your foot here, put your hand here, make sure you capture their head this way or put pressure on their neck or whatever the case is. Right. You know, or disperse your body pressure this way to make sure you have control. Like it's just, there's a lot of like small steps. And if you skip any one of them, maybe you're successful. doesn't mean you won't be successful. It just means that you're increasing the likelihood that your opponent has a chance to defeat whatever technique that you're using right same thing with hunting where it's like you if you skip a step or you miss one doesn't mean that you're not going to kill that mature deer it just means you gave that mature deer an extra advantage that he doesn't necessarily need to beat you you know and and so to me it's like they always parallel each other really really well and i feel like the one keeps my mind sharp for the other i guess is is the way i kind of look at it it's a really really great way to approach it i love that yeah yeah. So I'm going to, and then we'll, we'll transition into the hunting stuff here, but I'm stoked for the 165 pound <laughs> like bracket as well. Like I looked at the bracket and I'm like, Messenbrink has a pretty, I won't say easy because at the national level, no, none of the matches are, are easy, but he's got a clearer path to the finals than I thought he was going to have to meet O'Toole. Cause I really want to see he and O'Toole scrap. Um, Cause I think Carr and the kid from, uh, I forget where the other kids. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think they're all on O'Toole's side of the bracket. So, mm-hmm. you know, Mess and Brick doesn't have to go through any of them um, to get there. And then I want to see Carter Sirachi go scorched earth on everybody. Yeah. Like, <laughs> after the injury, yeah. 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 You know that I dude's just going to be fired up, well. dude. He's going to yeah. just destroy people. It's going to be seek and destroy for like four days. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be so great being a Penn State fan. It's like the Tom Brady area of Patriots is like. That's I mean, it, but, dude. But even significantly more dominant than that. I mean, imagine if half your team every year was like going to win the national title is just it's crazy the, the stuff yeah, that we were able to do with that team is is remarkable yeah we were talking about it today at the uh, at, at the gym and someone asked me how many people i thought how many national uh champions i thought we were going to have i said i think four i was like but i think we're going to have five in the finals and i was like i think we we yeah. lose one but the crazy thing was i was talking to my dad i was like this team is so stacked that I would not be. So there's a difference between being shocked and being surprised. I would not be shocked if any of the 10 won. Right. Mm -hmm. I would maybe be surprised if someone like Braden Davis won at 25 Mm -hmm. or Kasak won at 49. You know what I mean? Like there's a couple guys where it'd be, it would surprise you a little bit, but you wouldn't be shocked because they've shown all year they can hang with the best, you know? Yeah. But you anyway. know, it's funny you bring up Braden Davis, oh. and we're, we're going to transition into deer yeah. here. But this is like this will echo on because we're talking before the podcast about mentality and deer hunting, and and this point will come up again. But uh, Braden Davis's interview where he won the Big Ten title, and like, if if anyone hasn't seen that, go watch that because he's just like, yeah, it's not really a big deal. He's like, this is what I expected. This is exactly what should happen. Like. She, the interviewer asked her, like, how important is it for you to, like, start your team off good, you know, as being the first wrestler, you know, of your lineup to go out there and get your Big Ten titles, a true freshman. And he's like, he's like, 
Yeah, I guess it was important. Well, it's not really important at all. Like, yeah. basically, <laughs> it, and it's funny to explain that to someone because most people would think like, wow, this kid's really out of it. But it's like, when you prepare so hard for something, like, you need to see it as a guarantee to the point that it's so, it's almost underwhelming when it finally happens, mm-hmm. you know? Because like, you've, you've visualized yourself in those shoes a thousand times. You've seen yourself hitting those moves and winning and your hand on the, being raised, you being on the podium, like a thousand times. And in order to succeed at a level like that, you need to do that. And it's amazing that it's just, it's kind of hilarious that it was his reaction and that he just didn't give her anything to really mm-hmm. work off of in that interview. But, but honestly, when we talk about mentality with deer, that's a huge thing for me is like putting yourself in that position with thousands and thousands of shots and like believing that every time you set up that it's going to happen. And especially when you chase a specific deer, is every time you're shooting in practice, you're imagining that deer being the one you're shooting at. It makes it when those moments happen, like very sobering and you can relax in it and then you can operate on autopilot. You make a bunch of subconscious efforts in your practice to make, like you make a bunch of conscious efforts in your practice to make a subconscious effort when it finally comes. And it's right. exciting, but it's like, I've been here, you know? It's, it's funny you say that, man, because like last year was like, I've always you know, mental toughness or fortitude and, and, you know, accepting the grind and stuff like that. Like those are things that I think people kind of, kind of natural, I don't want to say naturally understand, but, but are more willing to understand, right? Like hard work equals results. Not all the time. Mm -hmm. It has to be the right hard work and good hard work. And and those will usually at some point, you know, equal results. But -hmm. last year, and again, it was this whole, you know, journey that I'm going on and with like the, you know, martial arts stuff is you know and it was also just um being more kind of like present and you know uh taking better care of myself both physically and mentally like and a lot of that stemmed from like starting jujitsu but it's also it's benefited me benefited me in a lot of ways beyond that which are more important to me you know and the one thing was last year as i I read a book that was primarily about meditation um, and was listening to some stuff just about visualization and stuff like that. And so I had a tournament last year, you know, and I, I used it for that initially where I was kind of like having anxiety or nerves about upcoming competition, you know, stuff like that. And sometimes you'll have that about that with hunting as well. Like depending on you know, if you put, like you put so much into it, it's, it's okay to have those types of feelings about something that you've worked really, really hard to do. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's pretty natural, pretty natural. Right. Um, and so that was kind of like my first attempt at managing it. And the one thing that the book talks about is kind of sitting in those feelings or sitting in those moments and like dissecting why you, why am I anxious? Like what, where is it coming from? It's like, well, it's coming from because I want to, if it's competition or whatever, it's like, because I want to win. Right. Um, does it matter if I win? No, it, it doesn't. You have to start answering yourself honestly. Like, what is it, What are you going to get out of it if you don't? And it's like, well, all these things, right? Is like all the things that are important to me, are they going to change if I win or lose? No, right? And so then you're able to kind of start to free yourself of like the stuff that starts to hold you back because of being afraid of making a mistake. And you're able to just to kind of go out and compete free or hunt free, right? And so I did that for the tournament. And I would do that before every match and I would sit and kind of like meditate and think about, you know, what feelings it was making me have and stuff like that. And then I started visualizing like winning matches and stuff like visualizing things and they would start to come to fruition. And so going back to hunting, I I wanted to kill this deer in Kansas more than any deer I've wanted to kill in a long time. And I actually started thinking about it and was making me a little bit anxious because I was like, good God, man, if I go out there for a third year and like have like a near like close encounter and can't seal the deal. I'm going to be, I'm going to be mad. And so I started to be like, well, why? And well, it's not a big deal. Like nobody's going to care. I'm just putting this pressure on myself for no reason. It makes it less likely that it's going to happen. Right. And then I started visualizing myself before I go to bed every night, I would like play out a scenario in my mind of like me killing that deer, just a deer. Like it wasn't the deer that I ended up killing, but it was just like me having success. Right. And then lo and behold, it happens. You know what I mean? It's one of those things. And like, people will say that you're crazy, man, but that stuff does matter. And it's, it's, it's not like, cause you can see it, you're going to do it, but it's, if you can see it and control, like 
how you feel about it, it makes it way more likely when the opportunities present yourself that you're that you got your shit together to actually make the shot, make the kill, and do all and make all the right decisions that have to happen in like that five seconds that you have to make decisions. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we could go on a whole entire podcast worth of <laughs> things on on visualization and the mentality of deer hunting and stuff like that. And, and you know, we already talk about it enough too. So like, I'm yeah. sure that we'll we'll divulge on that at some point. Yeah, yeah. But before we uh, before we jump into like all the stuff you had going on for, you know, hunting this year and stuff like that. Um, I just want to get a sense of, like for people who are listening, like a little bit about like your background and style, like your, your approach, uh, approach to hunting. So you're from Wisconsin, you know, you're mm-hmm. hunting some swampy areas. I imagine like, what is your overall kind of like, you know, approach to, uh, approach to bow hunting? So I, I try to break everything down into a process. So last year was the first year that I had actually hunted the marshes, gung-ho like beast style if you will um and i had hunted five years before that in hill country in southwestern wisconsin uh basically i, I went to college in uh at uw Platteville. i wrestled there and i got a mechanical engineering degree and then moved back here last year and so i was faced with the challenge of completely new land completely new type of country and everything like that and um i guess my style it's it's really kind of hard to define because i don't try to like box myself into any one thing where, you know, it funny, this goes right back to a lesson Ben taught me, but like, I was like, what's your pre-match routine? Like, what do you do to, to prepare? And I'm like, he's like, well, I like to have a routine, but I like to purposefully break it. And I like to be able to adapt to it. Cause you know, who knows what's going to happen. Maybe you get a call and you can't take part in your routine or like, you don't think your match is coming up. You're, you're going to fail if, you think this routine needs to be completed every single time before you go into mm-hmm. match. So you need to be versed, but you need to be able to adapt to, to change or to your opponent or anything like that. And so for me, I I like, if you had to throw me into a style, I like bed hunting. I think a lot of my, what I seek in hunting is, is related to beds. But I think the main thing that I succeed using is all the, like, the insane amount of tactics you hear online and things like that. I like every single time I hear something and decide to use it, testing it for myself in my situation, not just the situation that someone else is talking about that it may, may or may not work for where I'm at. I like thoroughly like vetting my sources that I listen to and thoroughly vetting the tactics that I use. And so I'll go out and try to prove theories wrong. Like if if I don't think something's going to work, I will make certain that, I am not just going off a sign and assuming a deer is traveling in some direction. I want to put eyes on it or I want to get as many reps in as I possibly can with every single thing I do. So I think the most important thing I do is I don't listen to just any one person. Um, I take everything that anyone I consider credible, um, what they say into account and I go and try it out for myself. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work and I let it lie. And if it does work, I'll be able to put it in my back pocket and use it. And it's allowed me to adapt to a lot of different situations over over the years and especially this last year killing in three completely different types of country in three different states than i ever have in this in this way i've obviously killed in wisconsin before but um yeah it's i think that's the most important thing for me is really just you know adapting to change Uh, if you had to throw me into style it'd be bed hunting but um i'm able to kind of apply those skills in many different situations and i think that's really important so whenever, like, I love that, man, because that was, that's been, that's been one of my charges for the past couple of years was, you know, I've talked to my buddy, Chad Sylvester about this. We've always kind of talked about it and, you know, I've always kind of said, I want to be multiple. I want you to be able to drop me off anywhere. And, and I have, I may not be a quote unquote expert, or it may not be my, my forte somewhere if you mm-hmm. drop me off, but I know enough that I can put myself in a situation to have success you know, without having to have like, you know, previous knowledge of an area. That's one of the reasons why I like to travel to hunts. Like I like to just go into places and not scout and just show up and be like, all right, I got seven days to figure it out. Let's just figure it out. You know? Um, and it makes you adapt, right? Cause you have no clue what you're going to get, what you're going to get into. Um, and that was my big thing of wanting to hunt more on the ground because that was like clearly something that I saw as like a hole in my game where I was like, dude, you get me on the ground with a bow and I'm, and I'm lost, you know? And so, and I was like, you know how you fix that? 
start going to Kansas. I was like, where there aren't any trees. And it's like, and you're forced to do it that way. You know, it's like you just forced yourself into that, you know, uncomfortable place to, to do it. But when, when was, was there a moment when you were like, I guess, was there a light bulb moment or something that happened where you were like, I need to just become more versed. I need to kind of have this adaptability. Cause I think we all kind of start in a way with just things that we're comfortable with. And we, we kind of get good at those, you know, and then, and then we go, man, I really, I'm, I'm missing out opportunities because I, I'm not able to do X. Right. I know at least like in athletics, whether it's wrestling or jujitsu or whatever, you know, you'll, you'll have like a game and then you're like, all right, my game would be that much better if I could add this element to it. Right. I could really threaten, you know, people that like to do, this like that like leg entanglements for example right like in jujitsu it's like okay well i need to be able to play leg entanglements because anyone who i roll with who has, does leg entanglements i get the the break speed off of me so i need to add that now you know i need to be able to adapt to that game so was there a moment for you and honey where you were like or a buck maybe even that like taught you a lesson where you're like yeah i need to i need to adapt a little bit because this deer's you know giving me fits yeah there's one deer in southwestern wisconsin that's a really big mainframe eight he'd probably go i don't know high 40s or something like that one mm-hmm. maybe 150 on some public around there and he had a like a ninth point coming off of his right g2 it was really subtle but i have like a on my wild calling instagram i have a short of him working a scrape in velvet and um i chased that deer like crazy i got so many different pictures of him and stuff and it was on sd cameras and and you know i kind of knew what i was doing but i just didn't have the confidence in myself to like push the envelope on him, like to really like creep up onto his bedding and, and just make an assumption and go after him. Like I find myself sitting in a place where I got a picture of him at one point or like sitting in a wide open bottom when I knew I should have been cutting the distance between his bed and there. And like, I just, you know, my dad was telling me, he's like, you're going to kill that buck this year. I'm like, I'm not skilled enough to kill that buck this year. Like, I, you know, that's a, that's a toad. And like, I, I'm not good enough for that. And it's like, just sitting back, I sounded so dumb to like, just rule myself out, you know? Right. And, and I, this is a year where I put like 300 to 400 miles boots on the ground in the hills. Like I would go and do 20 miles a day. Like I would start walking before the sun was up and finish when the sun had gone down. And I'd stop for maybe 30 minutes to drink and eat a granola bar half in between. That's it. And I just tore apart this area and I knew where that deer was. I just wasn't believing in myself. And, you know, I, I think that deer taught me that I need to be able to adapt. I need to be able to work in many different situations and I need to push the envelope more than anything. And I was so afraid of failing on this deer that I didn't put myself in position to succeed. And I, I just ruled that that would never happen again. Like there's so many people something that gets me is like, I can't sit this hub because a deer is going to spook and smell me. Like mature bucks are always dropping in a hub. So like, of course there's going to be one there. And it's not like every single time that someone sits in a hub on a sketchy wind, they see a mature buck every time and get busted. It's like, if you saw a mature buck, every time you sat in a hub, like you'd be sitting in a hub much more often. You know what I mean? It's a, so, you know, even if you got busted. So I was, I, I learned that it's really important to push the envelope and fail and then figure out why you failed or why that deer was doing something in that situation. So if I did spook a mature buck, I would make sure I know everything about it. Like, was he bedded? Was he standing? Which direction was he traveling? What's the wind doing right now? What time of year is it? Do I think he's headed towards does? Is he headed towards food? I would just break down everything I can in that situation. Or if I got a trail cam picture of a mature buck, like, and I could, I'd be out there as soon as possible trying to find what his track looked like, keeping record of that track. So Anytime I come across that track again, I know it's just as good as if I got a trail camera picture of him another time. And so I basically made myself a mobile camera by, you know, being able to identify tracks. I learned so much about tracking deer in that sense and and figuring out how they travel, how they use terrain. And it was more just I couldn't sit back and be so afraid of failing that I didn't let myself succeed. And it took a lot of reps and a lot of failure to, to start to learn, you know, and I think that's why I was successful last year in marshes is just because I put so much boot leather, leather burnt and, and I just went crazy scouting and, um, you know, just worked really hard at it. And 
it eventually yielded in success. But, you know, some people may go out for a year of hunting and they all, and I've talked to a lot of friends about this recently, but they'll like sit five times a year and they'll scout a couple days in the off season. And that will be like their year of hunting. And then they'll look at someone that's younger or whatever and be like, well, that kid's only X years old. Like he can't possibly know what he's doing. But that kid walks 300 miles and scouts 50 or hunts 50 days during the season or 60 days during the season. Like he's getting your eight years of experience in one year, you know, yeah. and, and he's failing over and over and over again. Maybe he's not like shooting a bunch of deer or whatever. But like to me, that's that's what matters is like absolutely busting it as hard as you can, leaving it all out on there, like all out on the field for, for lack of a better term. And not being afraid to fail and using failure as a learning opportunity instead of like getting down on yourself. And I think that I wouldn't have killed a single deer this year if I had let failure deter me at all. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's, I think, and I've talked about this with other, other, other folks, but I think you're so right that more people take themselves out of the game than, than the deer do in a lot, in a lot of cases, oh, yeah. I I think, you know, and I, I think it's a hard thing for someone to learn until they've seen, until they see it work. You know, I think that that's the hard part, right? Is that when you, when you, when you finally get the stones and you're like, you know what, I'm going to go set up on this, this buck's bed, you know, and I'm going to push the envelope and it may work and it may not work. Right. And you see it not work and it's not the end of the world, (laughs) you know, it's like, that's whenever it starts to change, it starts to change for you. You know what I mean? Yeah. To where it, it, that, that one kind of misstep isn't the end of the story. I mean, it might be a little different if, if someone's chasing a specific buck and they're doing it on private and they have, they're confined by boundaries and that deer might, you know, jump the property line and like bed now somewhere different. And like, there's, there's all kinds of different things that can, can happen. It can mess up a single deer, but I've always kind of been the mind that, especially when I'm traveling, that I will, I'm fine with, messing stuff up so long as I see the deer. Like if I can mm-hmm. see them and know where they want to spend time, then it was worth it to me because now I've got actual visual confirmation of stuff, right. That I can, that I can work off of. Cause for me, I think me, the big turning point was the, you know, the hunt I had in Iowa where I missed the same deer, like two different times, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, and yeah. then on the like the next to last day of the hunt, I kicked a buck out of a bed and I went up, you know, classic, you know, uh, bump and dump went back the next day and he, and he came back through like that evening to come check this like bedding area. And I, and I shot him at 16 yards. There was three mistakes I made, missed that one deer twice and then blew a buck out of his bed, you know, midday the day before. And it went back in to hunt him and killed him the next day. Like, and if it weren't for those three mistakes or the first two, I don't know that I would have felt great about the third one. You know, but it's like, I knew it's like, I missed the one deer once I found him again, missed him again. So I bumped this deer. There's, there's no reason why he wouldn't come back. You know, that was kind of my mindset. It was like, why not? You know, you took the time to see what actually happened to and learn from the situation. Like a lot lot of guys fail and they just put their heads down and walk back to the truck. And it's just, I think the difference between someone that excels quickly and someone that maybe takes a little bit longer to learn is they analyze their failures and Mm -hmm. figure out why they were wrong. They relate it back to maps so they can get better at e-scouting. You know, they relate it back to signs so they know what sign will pop up when it should be the correct situation to set up and, mm-hmm. and things like that. And I just think I was talking to a friend. I was scouting with a friend the other day, and this was like a childhood friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And I hadn't talked to him in many years, and we joined the softball league together. And he um, is starting to get into public land hunting, and he, you know, hunted private and stuff like that. Now he's got a kid that's turning one years old soon, and he's his life is really busy and i was scouting with him and he was like a little timid and like you know being very kind and trying to learn from the things i was saying and stuff and i just remember like feeling that way towards a lot of people in the hunting industry and meeting them and seeing their process and seeing how they kill and then being like well this is the same stuff i do you know Mm -hmm. like this is they're just another guy and it was such a stark realization for me that I just told him like when we got done I'm like hey like your time is as valuable as mine like you may have not gotten and he said he regretted not being able to do this when he was younger not doing it as much when he was younger like breaking out into public and I was like you don't you can't do anything about that now you could live a whole nother lifetime in 20 years and completely change 
your outlook and learn so much stuff. But the difference between me and you right now is just that I've done this for, I've done a lot of it. I, mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of years ahead of you. I've just done a lot of scouting and a lot of boots on the ground and a lot of failure. And I was like, it, it doesn't even take nearly as much as I've done to succeed. But th the point is, you go out there and bust your ass. You will see a linear increase in encounters with big bucks and you will succeed. But don't put anyone on a pedestal because they can hunt 50 days out of the year to year five. You know, don't put them on a, on a pedestal. They may be better and have more deer on the wall because of that experience. But it just takes you having confidence in your ability to, to succeed. Like no one's untouchable. No deer is untouchable. Like you can succeed, but don't elevate me in this situation, just know that you can do this and, and yeah. don't ever be nervous about it. Just go balls to the wall and figure it out. Cause that's when you'll succeed. That's just it, dude. Like it's, a, uh, and it's like that in any category too, right? You have, you know, especially if you're not, if you're just kind of getting introduced to, you know, people maybe that you've heard of or whatever the case is. And then, you know, um, then all of a sudden you realize like, Hey, check it out. They put their pants on just like me too. You know, it's, right, they're, right. they're no different. They're no different. You know, they've, mm -hmm. you know, I remember, you know, um, I kind of got introduced to that early in life, just in music, because I got to work with some, actually with some guys that I grew up idolizing and stuff. And I remember when I met them for the first time, you know, it was a little, it was a little weird. So I was like, man, I grew up listening to this guy's records, you know? And I was like, and I like, like dreamed of like, one day working with him or whatever. And I was like, and that was actually happening. And I said hello to him and he was potentially going to like produce our record. And he was like, Hey man, heard your stuff. Love it, dude. And he was like naming tracks. So I knew he actually listened to it. You know what I mean? He's like, Oh, that one guitar part is great. Blah, blah, blah. We could do this, that, the other. And I'm like, Oh my God, this dude, like, and he's talking to me like a peer, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, Whoa, like we just jumped right into like shop talk. It wasn't like, Oh, I'm this guy and I've done this and I've, sold millions of records and like nobody knows who you are yet. And this, that there was none of that. It was just like two musicians, specifically guitar players, just immediately starting to talk shop, you know, and that's, you know, as the kids say, when you find a real one, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, the, and I had that same kind of um, experience, you know, when I kind of first started talking to Dan, like it was very much just like, he would ask me questions. We would get done recording a podcast and he would ask me like, Hey, that deer you were talking about, Tell me, and he would just ask me a question like X, Y, and Z. And I'd be like, oh, wow, he was asking me a question, you know? Right. But that's how they get better too. You know what I mean? Like there's not a, there's not a magic to it. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, they've just, to your point, you know, some people have been doing it longer than others. And some people, you have to get rid of that. Like you said, that pedestal thing. And like, when you get an opportunity to talk to someone who, who has had a lot of success or has done things, th things well that you would like to maybe use some of their their tools or whatever. It's like, man, ask them, you know what I mean? Like yeah. the worst thing that can happen is they can say, I'd rather not talk. I'd rather not share that with you. <laughs> like, and that's fine. You know what I mean? But you right. won't meet very many people like that, you know? And if you do meet mm -hmm. people like that, you don't want to talk to them anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You and know? see the value in yourself. is just, it's, it's huge too. Like yeah. anyone is one break away from, you know, you look at the guy that killed the, the huff buck in Indiana, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. no idea that deer was there, no trail camera mm -hmm. pictures, anything like that. Just, looking for the next 120 that walked by and and kills a united states record typical like right just awesome and, and that could be anyone anyone any mm -hmm. day so yeah you know don't ever count yourself out it's, it's yeah. really important to me yeah so man i want to go back to the adapting piece right because you know talked about that you know being kind of you know like your calling card if if you will and and, <laughs> and, and, and i dig that because that's something that i i strive to kind of you know, have in my back pocket too. Um, before I ask you this question, I want to, like, I want to, I'm going to actually reverse this for a second. Cause I, I was going to jump into something else, but I had one other thing I wanted to kind of touch on. So whenever you're thinking, like when you're laying out a plan or a strategy or whatever, like, are you a, I think I probably know like what your answer will be to this. Mm -hmm. Are you a, let's execute the fundamentals with excellence or are you a, um, what's this flashy thing I can kind of pull out to like, for like the, like, let me do a win Dixie, <laughs> you know what I mean? Instead, <laughs> instead of like yeah. running a half, half down, right, you know what I'm right. saying? Like, so like, what's your approach to that? Cause mine, as I've kind of gone is I just see so many guys that are so, so skilled 
And what I always kind of come back to is they execute the fundamentals flawlessly or as close to flawlessly as possible. And that's why they're so consistent. Right. And mm-hmm. I think whenever you, you start to kind of get your feet under you hunting wise and you're like, I'm having a little bit of success. I'm starting to figure some stuff out. And then you start kind of getting fancy. You know what I mean? You're like, um, now yeah. I'm going to try this thing. Right. Or like, you know, I'm going to just bump and dump deer all day. It's like, it, it it's a, <laughs> it's a, it, it's an acquired taste and it, it does mm-hmm. work, but it's a very specific kind of like setup that it can work, that it can work in. And, and, but, and I think a lot of people kind of get tra- detracted with some of that stuff and they kind of forget about the fundamentals until like they've had those kind of fancy things blow up in their face a few times. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden they're like, Hmm, you know what? I'm going to go back to like entry exit strategy, playing the wind really well. And, um, making sure that I'm like, that I know where this deer is at and hunting his like most recent sign and hunting, you know, like where he wants to be, not where I want to be, you know? Don't so I'm just curious what your approach it. is yeah. to that. Is it fun? Are you fun? Are you a fundamental guy? Or are you like, let me get, get a little flash once in a while. So I would say I'm fundamentals up until the point that I got to get flashy with it. And it, and it's not to be, so a lot of guys like hunt certain ways to be flashy or to make <laughs> a statement or to make themselves like shown and they, and that's usually the guys that hear that I only hunt in this situation. And mm. I just feel like if you limited yourself to like, let's say only hunting on the ground or only hunting one stick or only hunting 30 feet high or 20 feet high or whatever, like only being able to hunt out of a saddle, only being able to hunt on a tree stand, like you would just not succeed mm-hmm. where I'm hunting right now. You just wouldn't like, you would maybe be able to find a quarter of the setups that I found. And you know, a lot of other people would be on those same setups because a lot of people put themselves in that same box. And so to, to give you the, the short answer, it's just really like I'm a fundamentals guy through and through. And if I have to do something off the wall, like shove myself into a skinny tamarack tree, or if I have to sit on the ground in the middle of a marsh while my boots are soaking wet, like I will do it if I believe that it will make me succeed. And if I fail, I'm just, that's another opportunity to learn and get better. And Mm -hmm. so I like to, and I, and I've said this a a few times, but I like to break it down into a process and I just kind of have like eight criteria that I like to fulfill no matter what like situation I'm in. You can put this in the hills, you can put it in the mountains, you can put it in swamps, you can put it in marshes, you can put it in river bottoms, anything, you know, plains, country, all sorts of stuff like that. But I like to have like eight criteria that I really look for. And I'm going to try to recall these off the top of my head, but I usually write them down if I'm saying it to someone. The reason I wrote these down is just so I can like convey it to people so that they can have something that they can follow along on as well. But it's kind of like second nature after you've gotten so many reps to, to look for these things. But the first thing I want to do is find bedding just because I believe in pressured areas. Most of the movement that happens at daylight is extremely close to bedding. And, you know, I've literally seen bucks get up from their bed. The buck I was after last year, like I've literally seen him get up from his bed I was 80 yards from him and he made it less than 30 in daylight. I couldn't shoot him and he never exited cattails. So to me, it's really crucial to first locate bedding, then locate what kind of buck is bedding in that area. Number two, just what's the class of deer in that area. Number three is when is that deer using that bed? Because like we talked about, if a deer does something two days in a row, it's usually dead here. It usually doesn't reach maturity if it's habitual. And so you got to become an expert on timing and you base that off a lot of uh, like, incentives around you but getting reps with that and being sure of the timing as in like you got a trail camera picture of him exiting that bedding so you know he was in that bedding or Mm -hmm. the absolute freshest sign or tracks or whatever like that will tell you for certain when he was using it at least so when he's using it i want to figure out like where i need to set up to kill so a lot of times in the marshes like you're limited to one single tree or one single ground set or something like that because they aren't betting anywhere that there's a lot of trees because that's where a lot of people go. Um, I want to figure out how I need to access that setup um, is really important to me. Uh, what direction I need to go in that. I feel like I may have skipped something here. Um, I want to figure out um, where other hunters are and how he may adjust to that other hunter pressure as well. So in, I guess that's kind of just a rough breakdown, but like, that's the process I kind of follow is like, I want to figure out where he's at, what class of deer he's at. It, it is. I want to figure out why he's there when he's there. I want to figure out how I need to set up in order to kill him, how I need to access that setup. 
where the other hunters are at and how that deer is going to adjust to that pressure. So like in the case of one of the bucks that I'm chasing that I showed you, mm-hmm. like I think between me and a buddy on like a Tuesday during working hours, we got like five or six people on cell camera shed hunting like a mile and a half back in this marsh. And so my whole scouting strategy for this deer next year is not going to be where was he at this year and what's the sign he laid down because I know a lot of people already know about this deer. I'm actually mm-hmm. going to scout more to see how he adjusts and like how he's going to change because of all that pressure that he's facing. And that's going to be my main thing with this deer I'm going after next year. And it's one of the main things that helped me pick up the original buck I was chasing in Wisconsin this year too. Mm-hmm. But I think if you use those different skills and you truthfully answer those questions in your head, or maybe you get seven to the eight or six to the eight or whatever, you're boosting your odds as much as possible, but you're also getting a lot better at dissecting the sign you're seeing and realizing what you can use those bits and tools, like a scrape as a tool or a track as a tool or a rub as a tool, what you can use those tools to find information about. That way it's not just like abstract, like, oh, there's a rub, there's a scrape. That's a good buck. That's not a good buck. Like now you can use it to your advantage and truthfully like execute on what you're mm-hmm. finding instead of just walking around and dropping pins. Yeah, man. I love that, dude. It's a, uh... It makes me think of journaling, you know, and that was one of the things, you know, that I mean, I've done for a a little while hunting, you know, hunting wise. And it really helped me, you know, after I would get done scouting and it wasn't necessarily always uh, necessarily journaling about a specific pin or a location all the time per se. Right. It might just be me writing down like what I saw that day. And then and then maybe I'm flipping through trail camera pictures and I go, oh, wait a minute. You know, it, it's just one of those things where it just, it helps me recall things a little bit more quickly. Like a good example of it was we were scouting this weekend and, um, I, I hunted this one area and I didn't get a lot of hunts in this particular spot because I ended up killing my deer or killing a deer in PA early. And I thought I heard, I, well, I know I heard a buck grunt, but the, the Pennsylvania hunter in me, when I heard it, I thought it was a person, but this area is just like so big that there's there was no way there was a hunter where I was at, but it's like my just first instinct is going, I can't believe there's a guy two miles back here. He's set up 200 (laughs) yards or a hundred yards from me. You know what I mean? That's like my initial thought. And, uh, I mean, I kind of realized like a doe came, some does came out of there later and stuff like that. And I realized, okay, that was a buck. So when I was in there scouting yesterday, kind of walked back to that spot and sure enough, there was like a hammer rub that was back there, you know? And so I just kind of like take note of that. And I journaled after that hunt. And so I went back and looked at the journal, you know, it was like, okay, what was the wind direction? Blah, blah, you know, blah, 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 blah. Roughly what direction did that grunt come from? I just kind of went through like some of the questions that you're asking. It's like, okay, I know where the bedding's at here. I know the does are bedding over here. The bucks like the bed over this way, you know? And so I'm just kind of going through the Rolodex of like all these things. Like, what do I actually know now? Like, here's another piece of the puzzle. What does it mean? You know, and what direction is traveling? Of- you're doing that? that off of observation. Like you're doing yeah. that off of observation and the things that you weren't sure of, you went back and checked. Yeah. So like, why did it fail or why was that buck there? And so you yeah. like that inquisitive nature is what begets success. I think the one thing I left out was travel direction, but that's kind of goes along with where I need to set up to kill him. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good, really good point you made there. Yeah. It's like, and so I've just learned for me, like I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm much more a visual person, like an observation person, you know, and, and I kind of, and I figured that out and I kind of always thought that, but I really figured it out this year. And it was really the Kansas hunt that taught me that because once I got a visual, it was like that deer was, that was, he was dead. And like, that was all there was to it. And so, and so now for me, and some people don't need that visual for me. It's like, I gotta, I feel like I I have to have it. Cause it just gives me that confidence to know that like, all right, I know what this deer is doing. I just need to see him do it one time. And if I can do that. And it was actually funny. Like Joe Rentmeister is almost the same way. Like I pointed it out to him the last podcast we did, he was talking about, you know, these couple different deer that he was on, he had killed and kind of how he killed them. And, and we got done recording and I asked him, I was like, Hey, do you think you are a super visual hunter? And he was like, no, not really. And I was like, because you, Every deer you just told me about killing, I was like, you had a visual on him before you ever killed him. He's like, oh, I never thought of that. You know, yeah. and I never thought of it either until that conversation with Joe, because I know, you know, um, Jared Scheffler, like big on visual, but they hunt a lot of plain stuff. Right. And, and he would say that to me and it never made sense to me until it actually happened this year. And then I was like, oh, damn. Okay. I get it now. Like hundred percent. Like, so I'm an observation guy. And then I start putting all the pieces together because 
some of it does come to you in the abstract, right? It's like you get a trail camera picture here and there. And it's like, maybe you know the direction of travel, maybe you roughly know where he's bedded, but you may, maybe don't know where he's spending a bunch of his time or what's his loop or how is he traveling? What terrain exactly is he using? Like you need some of those other kind of pieces, whether it's a track, like you were saying, or it's a rub that he can leaves. It's like identifiable by him, you know? Um, you know, so I always try to kind of connect those things back and then write them down and then go back and look at it again and get a trail camera picture. And I can like go back and look at my journal again, you know? So I'm kind of a nerd in that way. I even do it with jujitsu. <laughs> I journal after every session. Like I sit down and write down like all my roles, like what I did wrong, what I did right, what worked, what didn't, you know? That's a um, great way to do it, man. You're just squeezing yeah. every ounce you can out of every experience you get. And I think that's that just it. makes someone so efficient with learning. The same thing with like a visual is just like, there goes all the doubt. Like that's certainly what happened. That's certainly the deer that was there. Like, mm -hmm. and so now you have the opportunity to learn in real time. And mm -hmm. it, I think that's, you stand to gain so much more when you actually record it. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the other kicker is uh, no one's heard this actually. This is like, you're the oh. first. Yeah. So there we go. It, it's, um, so that one deer I had shared with you, right. Um, mm -hmm. he was, a uh, a late season guy. Right. Mm -hmm. And I hunted that area. I think it was on the fourth cause we can't hunt Sundays. The fifth was a Sunday and the sixth was a Monday. Um, so I hunted him on a Saturday after the rain, uh, after a rainstorm blew through, I got out, it rained all day, like poured rain. And as soon as it stopped at like, I think it stopped at like two and I got out of the truck at like one thirty and hiked in and got into a tree. And, um, that was when I heard that buck running back there. And then that big deer, December, right? Like that's when he shows up. Like well, last week of October, or I'm sorry, last week of November, first week of December. I have like half of his, like part of his rack that I'm pretty sure that's him on a trail camera, not far from that area on the sixth. So he was in the area, and it's the area he likes to spend time in, and it's not far from where I, where we think he's bedded. And so it, it like, so to that point, it's like, I saw those pictures and like, I had written all this stuff down and it's like, and I go back and I look and I'm like, and I see like half a rack. I saw like a G2 and part of a G3. And I was like, man, there's only one deer in the area with that frame. Like it's gotta be him, you know? And it puts him in the general area way earlier than I had ever thought. And it puts him actually there whenever I like in that general area, in the time frame that I heard that buck run. So just to your point, it's That's like, sweet you start putting the puzzle pieces together. If you're observant, if you write stuff down, if you start kind of having a criteria for what you want to know. And so now I feel a lot better about what I think I know about this deer. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome that you put all that together. That's great. Yeah. It's kind of like a beautiful mind. Like it's, it's like scattered everywhere. <laughs> right. Like every now and then like a, like a scene. yeah, it's yeah. like a picture comes into focus. You're like, Holy shit. You know, it's right. like, right. Kind of what happens. You know, that was actually what happened today. Cause I didn't see it yesterday. I went through all the photos and, um, I actually got up this morning, was having my coffee. Um, it was just sitting here. I was like, I'm going to flip back through a bunch of those pictures again. And I was flipping through and I saw that one and it never, I, it never registered yesterday. And I saw it and I was like, wait a minute. You know, I was like, <laughs> cause I have him on that camera, like at a different time of the year too. So it's like, he's mm -hmm. in there just at a different time. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, I think it's him, you know? And so I started putting, and then I was like, wait a minute. I was like, there's a big rub back there. And I was like, it's a pretty sizable rub. And this area doesn't have big rubs. Like the deer don't make big rubs typically. And it was a pretty sizable tree. And I was like, Hmm. And I was like, all right. I was like, I think spidey senses started going off. Right. And then I got super stoked. I was like, why isn't it October? <laughs> right. Right. That's awesome, man. I was like, I want to go, I want to go hunt him now. But, uh, <laughs> so man, so you had to adapt, like this was a long way to get back to adapting, but you had to adapt this year because you had your target deer that you wanted to kill this year, like ended up getting killed. Like, was it while you were in Ohio? Is that what it was? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so it might have like been the day I killed in Ohio. It was the day you it, killed in Ohio. It, it might have been. I I don't have a specific day because the guy that mm. killed him never reached out to me or anything and okay. tried to locate him, but he hasn't contacted me at all. So how do you flip the script on that man? Because that's like a that's a kick in that's a kick in the pants, you know? Oh, like that's, for sure. Oh, you put so much I, time and effort in, right? And then all of a sudden, you know, the deer's dead. Like I had yeah, one dude. this year that got killed that I'd hunted in this one particular area. But it was all, it was after I had already filled a tag. So I was kind of like, oh, that sucks. I won't see him next year. But it mm -hmm. wasn't like it was a deer that I was actively hunting at the moment, you know? Yeah. I had never pursued one single deer as much as this one. Like for people that haven't seen 
my Wisconsin kill, which kind of goes over the story that leading up to this, which includes this deer. It's a typical six by six, like probably really close to a net booner, if not mm-hmm. all of it. I mean, I saw a similar deer at a, we went to a sports expo in Wisconsin that were 180 gross and netted, mm-hmm. you know, netted a Boone and Crockett status. And man, they just don't get big as typicals around here all the time. You know, they don't get, <laughs> they don't get a, a booner frame. <laughs> they usually start growing junk and then they wouldn't net out at that. And I'm not much of a guy for net, but a big typical, typical frame is really cool, let alone a mm-hmm. clean six by six. But, um, yeah, man, I just devoted so much time to this deer. And I remember, and that what, what kind of made me laugh earlier in this podcast, we were talking about, you were, you're talking about how made you nervous thinking about killing a big deer. And then you practice visualizing it. The exact same thing happened to me where I, I had gotten, got a picture of this deer on SD cam and hunted an island later than I thought I like should have and realized that I had missed it, you know, missed the initial window I could have got on them. And from that point on, like breaking down what I had seen in spring scouting, like having all this data in front of me, I was like, holy crap. Like I, like I can make this happen. Like this is really realistic. I could kill this deer and it's the biggest thing I've ever even gotten on camera. Not not anymore, but it was the biggest thing I'd ever even gotten on camera at the time. And now it's like, I have a really good chance to kill this deer. And so in short, how this season went was, four encounters with him within range, never cleared cattails in daylight. Um, I had him spook my last encounter with him before I left for Ohio. He was at probably five to three yards from me in the dark as I was getting down from my tree stand. He was delayed getting to me because another hunter was like exiting. He waited for the other hunter to pass and then got right up to me. I could like hear him breathing. It was just (laughs) insane. And then he smelt me and, and spooked off, but it made me really nervous to think that I could have a shot at this deer. And so I was like jittery at work thinking about it. And mm-hmm. so I like switched to like total wrestling visual- visualization mode, practicing shots, picturing that deer in my mind. I would go into hunts instead of like listening to like a hunting playlist or whatever. I would listen to time by Hans Zimmer. Like I would listen to classical music mm-hmm. and just zone in and get like borderline pissed off and like, just like, rock solid like this is what's going to happen this is what i work for i work my whole life to do this like this is what i'm going to achieve just to have him you know get shot while i was in ohio and um it was most certainly a kick in the pants like (laughs) i had never spent so much time chasing a deer i learn pretty much everything when i hunt i don't learn nearly crap from cell cameras or SD cams or anything like that. I learn my information when I'm hunting by what I observe during a hunt. And so instead of going to a bunch of different properties, I was mainly focused on this one and I knew this was the only deer worth anything in the area. And I had just taken a whole season's worth of like up until November, a whole season's worth of knowledge. And now it's out the window. Like all the things that I learned during a season were essentially removed at this point. And it was a terrible blow. Like the closest I've ever been to tearing up over a deer, um, Mm -hmm. that wasn't of joy, you know, (laughs) Right, right. um, I remember just being on cloud nine, leaving Ohio, you know, like said goodbye to, I was hunting with Jake Bush, said goodbye to him. You know, I got a buck in the back of the truck, second deer of the year, second state. And I was like super happy. And then like midway home, my friend sent me a screenshot, actually a friend I was scouting today with Cam, sent me a screenshot of this buck on the ground and some like guy with a like crossbow in the background. He's like, this can't be, this is a cruel joke, but like, is this the deer you're after? And I was like, oh my God, I go to find the post and the guy deleted it. And so just like a big mystery with that. But mm-hmm. if he hadn't taken a screenshot of that post, like I would have been chasing a ghost the rest of the year. And, right. Yeah. Um, dude, I was so sad. And then I was pissed off. And then like, it took me like a good hour. And I was like, why are you being, for lack of a better term, why are you being such a little bitch about this? Like, Mm -hmm. why are you just getting down about this? Like the the handcuffs are off. Like you're free. Like go chase another one of these deer you got on camera, go chase some of these other giants you could. And when I was in Ohio, I got a cell camera picture on a bed that I call a kingpin bed on a nice 10 point entering it well really nice 10 point entering it and uh 
following does in and he was frequenting um, this area that I had previously had does betting all year long. And um, it just got me jacked up to know like I'm free, I can go chase whatever now. I got another prospect that I am pretty certain where and when he's betting. And it was like, use this as motivation to never let the deer that you're after get killed by someone else again. Like never let, like I obviously didn't do enough work in order to kill that deer. There's no other excuse. You know, you could call the other guy lucky or whatever. You could say I got unlucky. You could say I deserved it more than him or whatever. But like in my mind, like any failure is, is on my shoulders because if it's not, then I don't have the opportunity to solve it. And I want to be able to solve it. And so, you know, it, it was, I didn't do enough work to kill that deer. I wasn't good enough, but now I'm going to learn and I'm going to go chase some other deer and I'm never going to let that happen again in my mind. And it, it may happen again down the line, but I, I sure as hell wasn't letting it happen this year. And so I, I just began my chase again. I just used it as motivation and fuel and, and got back after this 10 point that I ended up killing. Nice. So you got pictures of him, right? So how mm -hmm. did, how long, I forget when you killed that deer, like what, what time? So, so I killed you, my one in Ohio, November 4th or 3rd or something like that. And then I ended up killing mine in Wisconsin, November 10th. Mm -hmm. um, so it was funny. It was actually in the same week. I didn't realize it, but it felt like a lifetime between that. Right. Was, I'm sure, dude, because you go through, oh, at that point, you go yeah. through like the emo emotional roller coaster, right? Of, of like, mm -hmm. yeah, I killed a buck in Ohio. Like, and it was a mm -hmm. great buck. You know, it was an awesome hunt. I watched that video. And, um, you know, and then you're, you're coming home, you're like pumped up and your buddy sends you this text. And you're like, dude, you know, it's yeah. like everything I worked for is like in the shitter, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and then you right. go back from that to like, all right, I'm going to get after you. Like you pick yourself up, you dust yourself off. You're like, I'm gonna get back after mm -hmm. it now. You know, it's like, and then, you know, and then, you, and then you have to start the work again, which is daunting. Right. And then, right. you know, and then and you the kill that deer like, and it's like the high of that. And it's like, Wah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's like it's funny because it's like it's never about killing a deer to me, right? You know, it it shouldn't ever be about that to me. It's about like the work and enjoying it, and then I get to do this every day. I get to spread this to people, and and I I don't know when I'm ready to tell this story, but like hunting is pretty much the reason I'm talking to you right now, and it's still mm. alive, and mm. like very very clearly it is. And my my mission with anything I do with any of this is to give someone the love for themselves that I found through hunting and, and allowed mm. that to be passed on to other people. And, um, and that, and that's a long story, but like, that's why I do this stuff, you know, and, and how am I aiming towards that mission? If I give up, like, how am mm. I improving to that? And everything I don't want to be is the guy that cares about inches and wants this social status and all sorts mm -hmm. of crap like that. That's the, the very opposite of who I want to be. Cause that's, probably would, would lead you down the opposite road straight into depression and right. you know comparison is a thief of joy like all that stuff and so dude that's such a good quote comparison is a thief of joy yeah yeah that's great and it's dude. just and it's just i try to live by that but you know i think it's also healthy to compete but you know you can't let someone else's situation dictate your happiness and i just think that I allowed myself to get so depressed over this thing and, and I lost sight of what my mission was. And I got so pissed at myself for, for doing that, for losing sight and allowing myself to be worked up over a deer that I have no right to, you know, mm -hmm. just as much as the other guy. And I, I just reminded myself of why I do this and it motivated me to go out and achieve that dream. And, mm -hmm. and honestly, the goal is not everything. The goal is not important at all. In, in anything in life, the goal is not important. The goal is essential only to the extent that it allows you to pursue something. So mm -hmm. you need a goal in order to have a journey that you go down. You need to be heading in a direction. Whether you achieve that or not is not important. It's mm -hmm. just that you enjoy the work that you do toward it, that you're willing to go through the pain because it's something deeper that you're working towards and that you can stick to that. And that's what I truly find the value in life is you just surrender the outcome. You become obsessed with the process and you enjoy all the things along the way. And then you can really never fail. You'll be surrender a the outcome. The that world. is such a, that's such a great way to look at it. Like yeah. it's um like the, uh, it's funny cause we started off talking about wrestling and we were talking about Penn state, you know, like great time to be a Penn state fan, right? Like for wrestling yeah. Yeah. and what they've done is exactly what you're talking about. 
if, like if someone needs a model of like what does that look like and how can you attain with that like with the outcome not being the the primary objective mm-hmm. look what they've done and listen to how any of those guys do interviews afterwards yeah. because like like you nailed it man like that is like it's so good man and it, like you just got my gears turning cuz I know how you feel about it. You know, like I've, I can't say that I feel hundred percent similarly about hunting. Cause we, we came to hunting in different, in different ways. Right. Um, mm-hmm. it, it sounds like a little bit, um, but I understand what you're saying because for me, music was kind of like that for me at first, right. Where, um, I haven't told a whole lot of that story other than I've just, you know, said like I was in like a, not a great spot, you know, let's just put it and we'll just leave it at that. And music was kind of like my savior. You know, and, and so for me, you know, I ended up leaving music and people were really kind of shocked whenever I did, because I just decided one day I was going to leave. I still play every day. Like I got a guitar sitting behind me. I play and sing every day. Cause it brings me, brings me joy. Right. It's why mm-hmm. I do it. It's why I always started. That's why I started doing it when I was a kid. Um, and the reason why I ended up leaving was because it was turning so much into a business mm. that the, the reason why I got involved in it in the first place was never about that it was about yeah. way more than like trying to make a career out of it and stuff like that and the way i always described it to people is that you know music never cheated on me and i and so i would mm-hmm. never cheat it yeah you know like i couldn't like music has give, had given me my life essentially and for that i could never cheat the honesty and the integrity and like the purity that is music you know whenever mm-hmm. it's done the right way and so that was why that was why I left, you know, because uh, it again it was the journey, it wasn't the goal, right? There was a yeah. bigger reason as to why I was doing it, and uh, I lost my way for a little while with it. And then I, when I realized, you know, that I had lost my way, that was whenever I was like, I've gotten, like, it's given me everything that it was that it was meant to give me, and now it's kind of my duty just to kind of like carry it on and keep it with me, you know. It's a, it's mm-hmm. its purpose is no longer to propel me any longer it's it's built me up right if it's like Mm -hmm. a weird way to kind of think about it it's like it's built my foundation back to where i'm capable right again and Mm -hmm. and so so at that point i was like not that i didn't need it but i was like i don't need to use it any longer i need to go out and live the life it's allowing me to build now right if that's That's a great point that's fantastic because it's like you're you're relating an entire separate area of your life as you know as this tool to it's hard because it's so transformative to just describe it as a tool but mm-hmm. it is as a tool to help you excel in every other area of your life mm-hmm. to help you learn these hard lessons about hard work and about you know it being about the journey and not the outcome and that that's what looking back i just think that first book i was never meant to kill I just think it was 100%, an dude. absolute blessing. I think it was a gift from God to be able to chase it. I learned so much from it, but I developed just this insane level of determination that I thought I had before, but it's just like, just, it was just next level. <laughs> and, um, like to, to put into a number, like the determination I had with this, this next deer that I ended up killing in Wisconsin, it's like, I, I got to that point where I was visualizing for visualizing forever. I was going to kill that 12. And I needed to transfer that into whatever deer came into me, came into my setup next. And I went after this 10 and I practiced this a lot. So I wouldn't recommend this to anyone, but I held draw for two minutes and 15 seconds on this buck because I had a doe coming underneath me and I was expecting her to bust me if I moved. So when she had her head clear cup, like get into cover, I held, I drew and it took him two minutes and 15 seconds to get where I could shoot him. And I was rock solid. Like there was not a single thing in this world that, you know, my muscles were aching and stuff, but that's nothing, you know, Mm. that that being in pain is nothing, you know, like it's that, that 12 was a vehicle for me to mature as a person and adapt as a hunter and learn the things that I needed to do to excel in the future and succeed. I think the shallow thing you could take from this is succeed on that 10 and Mm. make it, make it happen in that way. But I think, I think it's going to apply to a lot more of my life. And so when you ask me or someone else in the future, what deer taught me a lot of lessons, it's going to be that 12. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to see myself down the road using this determination that I gained from him to succeed. Now that, that 12 died 
at someone else's hand and he's I'm sure that guy is ecstatic, you know. Right. But it the gift that that guy did by killing that deer to me will produce a lifetime of success in my opinion. Right. Yeah. And not that I was never going to work hard enough to achieve it anyways, but that it was very transformative for me, similar to the way music was for you. Yeah. And I I think the interesting thing is that I think as we kind of go through life and things change and stuff like that, you know, we find new things that kind of build upon that, build upon that foundation that that first kind of muse, if you will, gave us it. It's the springboard to let us do everything. You know, it's like, to me, it's like, it, you know, cause from there it was, you know, I left music and then that was when I found bow hunting actually, cause I gun hunted all growing up and stuff like that. And it wasn't, I didn't become a bow hunter until I was like 30. And it was because there was a part of like the music stuff that I wasn't done with yet. And that was like the feeling of like walking out onto a stage with like 3000 people. Right. It was yeah. that feeling that you get of all the work that you've done. Cause it wasn't the crowd so much. It was, it was the, all the work that I've done with my bandmates of writing these songs and perfecting our craft and recording and stuff like that. And now we get to present them to you. You know, it was that it wasn't that there's X number of people. It was that I get to show you the stuff I made. It's like a kindergartner mm-hmm. coming home. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like right. that was really like the, the, the part of it. And so I was kind of missing that, like, let me show you what my process created. You know what I mean? And so for, for me, like bow hunting became that moment of truth became, let me show you the process that I created (laughs) again. You know what I mean? Like all the work I did, it culminated in this, like this moment when you and I meet, you know, in, in the woods, you know, and then to your point, like, and I loved that what you said, like comparison is the thief of joy. Like I was experiencing that. And honestly, that's what jujitsu gave me back because it gave me space from hunting. It, it, it told me it's okay to not obsess over it every day. It's okay to have some space from it. It's okay to like enjoy other things because then whenever I get to actually do it, it's like, I love it as much as I did whenever I was a kid. You know what I mean? It's like, I'm excited for like the first, like I'm excited to go out and scout. I'm excited to do all this stuff because some of it was starting to steal the, steal the joy. And it was, and that's why I like jujitsu so much because it gave all that back to me. And so it becomes like another part of like building off that music foundation that, that bow hunting added to that started to deteriorate. And that now all of a sudden jujitsu has like built onto that foundation with like the whole thing always being that it's the process. It's the learning. Mm -hmm. It's the hard work. It's all that stuff, no matter what the goal is, whether it's writing a song, winning a, a tournament, or, you know, getting within bow range of this critter that like is better than me in every way, shape and form. And we happen <laughs> to, we happen to kind of connect at this like moment, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, to me, that's what it's all about, man. You know? And so I love just like the way you think about it, dude. Like, it's awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. I think we have a lot of similar thought paths in this stuff. Well, it's really awesome. We like, it's, there was something there, like just the fact that like the way we kind of chat and stuff like that. And it was always mm-hmm. kind of like really cool conversation, it, you know, and we have a lot of interest in a lot of the same areas and stuff like that. Um, but dude, that's awesome. So, th- so wh- what was your setup on this tent? So like you, you knew he was around and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. and you were, de- you were determined, right. And that, that 12 really kind of is what was set you up for, for success really in, in the grand scheme of things. But what was like the final kind of, puzzle piece when you were like, all right, I think I know, I think I know where I'm going to have this, you know, the, the meetup with this guy. Yeah. So I, so I scouted this area in a video that is on my channel and, um, I determined that this bed was being used all year round because it was warm to the ground Mm -hmm. Had a giant rub in it. It was one of those thick tamarack trees, but you could tell he's basically just rubbing it with his bases. So I was like, oh, this is wide brow tine like big frame kind of deer mm-hmm. and um and i thought it was being used year round because there's a lot of hair in it well what was really happening and what i found out um was that the does were using it habitually but that buck was just using it because it's an isolated root ball that he could hold up with a doe with and easily defend and monitor and keep other bucks away from <laughs> and so 
it was really interesting to me to, to learn that because I was wrong about my timing. And um, obviously, I put a cell camera up to figure out information about that area and if I was right on timing or not. Because I went in there in the early season, hunted it. If it was a terrible sit, did nothing resulted. And so I put a cell camera up on the way out to try and get my timing right. And, um, you know, I got him coming in on that. And I realized that, like, I wasn't going to succeed where I was getting pictures of him. Like I set up there, I knew he was in the area and I could hear him working off and betting further back. And I could have just been a, a dork and set up over and over again on the place that I had gotten pictures of him. Or I could have, what I did is lean back, think about the bigger picture and my scouting, where is this buck likely going to be? Where is he moving to? Why am I not seeing him when I'm hunting there? And I was like, all right, I'm going to scout my way in and like, truthfully figure out what this deer's doing, what's going on. And I'm not going to be like, oh, he'll just show up on camera. I just need to get lucky, you know? Mm -hmm. And so on the way in, I found a doe and heat bed. Um, basically I got to an intersection where I could have gone towards that camera and I could have gone somewhere else. And I actually diverted to an area I'd never been before. I'd never set up in it. I had only walked through it briefly scouting and it was like 250 or 300 yards from where that camera was. So in a marsh of tamaracks and cattails, that's a very, very far distance because mm -hmm. you can't see 10 yards in cattails. <laughs> and so I, w I was taking a big risk, but I was like, man, the sign is just lining up for me to go back here. So I'm following these trails and I find a, a fresh doe and heat bed. You can just smell the reeky estrus in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I kept following it back and I got to the point where all right, like these tamaracks, these root balls are setting up that exact same way. Like, I think he's holed up with a doe back here. And, um, you know, I say in the interview, I'm hoping that 10 I'm after will come right down this trail right to me. Like, and that's exactly what he does. <laughs> and it, and it was basically just like, all right, I may get aggressive here and sit a new area and fail, but I'm at least going to rule out another area. I mm -hmm. only had like three sits left at this point in, in the whole season before daylight savings switched on. And I wasn't going to be able to hunt after work, which meant pretty much my season was over because gun season was kicking in right. Wisconsin. And so I was like, I'm not going to just rest on what I've seen him do before. I'm going to go and scout in. And um, he ended up doing exactly what I thought. I actually heard him stand up in the bed with the doe and drink water. And I just thought of <laughs> first thing I thought was like, oh, that that's interesting. Like the deer drink, not like a dog where they lap it up, but they like suck it up like their nozzle oh, wow. straw like a human would. <laughs> And then right. I'm like, wait, that means the deer's extremely close to me right now. <laughs> like, I, I remember thinking like, oh, that's interesting. And I was like, oh my God, that means he's right there. So like, right. um, I heard them get up and I heard him grunting and following this doe and dude, the adrenaline was at an all time high, but the focus was just laser like, and, um, yeah, I, what ended up killing that deer is really just not resting on prior experience and knowing that having enough confidence in myself that I had the skill to dissect where he was and what he was mm -hmm. doing. And I was able to copy and paste that previous situation that I knew he was using to another area and, and made it work. Yeah. That's so key, man, that the copy and paste that you just kind of mentioned, it's, uh, I've kind of referred to that as, uh, like my, my bow hunting deja vu, you know, mm -hmm. where it's like, I'll get some, and it usually happens to me out of state where it's like, I'll walk into a place and I'll be like, Oh man, I feel like I've been here before and I've never been yeah. there before, but it's like, it just sets up exactly like something I've seen. And that's why going back to what we were talking about too, being adaptable, right? Hunting so many different kinds of areas because I've walked into a Creek bottom before, or it was actually a river bottom in Missouri. And when I saw it, it laid out exactly like a swamp that I've hunted before, just without the swamp foliage, like the layout, the way mm -hmm. the terrain rolled, like everything felt the same. And I was like, there's the setup. And then mm -hmm. sure enough, I didn't hunt it that evening because I was like, I think this is a morning setup. And we went back the next morning and we ended up having three shooters come through and oh, nice. didn't get, didn't get a shot at either or any of the three, two of them came running through chasing a doe. And then one of them was just a little bit, you know, out of, out of bow range. Um, but never having been there and was like, yep, it's a morning spot. And right here's where we need to set up, you know, that's, be success where, in, yeah, that's, that's it. That's a hundred percent success in my book. That's it. And yeah. that's, I, I, I like, I'm glad you said that, man, because the, I try to, on, on this show, you know, make sure people frame success the right way, you know, that it's not always tag filled buck in the back of the truck. You know, that's not always success. Um, especially if you're a guy who 
can only hunt five or six days a year because you have a wife, you have kids, you have work, whatever. Right. Like that's not, that's not reasonable. I mean, I wish you the best and I hope you fill tags all, all the time, but it's just like it, it going back to what you said earlier, it will steal the joy, you know, mm-hmm. from you. If you're comparing your success to other people's who maybe have more time, it's whatever the case is like, no, nobody's no two lives are the same. And so you can't, you can't compare to what, this person is doing to what, to what you're doing. You should only ever compare you to you, you know? And, yeah. and, and, and I know it sounds like so hokey cause you're like, we see so much competition. It's like, and it's win, win and loss. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you, if you look at, you know, if there's a guy listening and maybe you're a new hunter and you're not filling tags, you know, maybe you've gone five years and you've not filled a tag. If you look back at the hunter you were four years ago, are you a better hunter than that guy? And if the answer is yes, then you're, then you're successful, you know, and that's, and, and I used to not look at it that way. And it wasn't until I started training that like, I was kind of not down in the dumps, but you know, I was just like, man, I want to get better at this. And and my coach just said, he's like, Hey, he's like, could you, could you kick Clint's ass from six months ago? And I'd be like, Oh, that's what I was going to say. I was like, yeah, I was like, I'd murder him. He's like, yeah, then you're, then you're just where you're supposed to be. You yeah. know, Clint, Clint today is a lot harder to kill. <laughs> Clint today is a lot harder to kill. That's exactly yeah. it, man. You know, and so, like, and the, and the thing is, like, you, people need to think about that with bow hunting too, man. It's like, you know, are you a better version of yourself today than than you were a year ago as a, as a bow hunter or two years ago or whatever? Like, you know, I always say that you know it was it was funny. I you know killed that deer in, in Kansas, and and some people thought that it was going to change like not change me, but like change how people perceived me. Like there were some mm-hmm. people who thought that, you know, and I was like, that's not how this works, nor should it. But I was mm-hmm. like, I was as good a bow hunter last year as I am this year. And probably two years ago. And I was like, and just because I filled these two tags doesn't mean that I'm all of a sudden better. You know, yeah. I was like, it's a, it's a building process. I was like, I'm sure I'm better than I was two years ago. Cause it's like, I work at it and I want to be better. You know, I was like, but the f- filled tags wasn't the, wasn't the stamp of like, okay, you've now gotten better. You know, I was like, that well, wasn't to get there is what matters. Right. Exactly. I was like, you know, yeah, exa- exactly. And I was like, and you know, people need to kind of recognize that and look at it that way, man. It's like, cause it's not all, it's not all, you know, filled tags isn't the, the marker of success, you know? Um, and I think yeah. if, if people look at it that way, then, then they'll never lose the joy. The joy will always be there. Cause it's not about that, that part of it, like holistically. I heard I heard a quote from Andrew Huberman the other day, and he was quoting someone else, and I can't recall who, but he basically said like the difference between burnout and longevity is being genuine or or <laughs> being um, wholehearted. Being wholehearted mm-hmm. is the word he used, and it's like if this is something that you are wholly invested in, and you're doing it because you love it and you love the process, and you don't care about that goal, you're wholeheartedly into it, like you can't burn out because mm-hmm. it's like does a fish get burnt out of swimming like does a bird <laughs> get burnt out of flying? like this great, is like this is a great way you, to look at it like this is what i was put on this earth to do you know to yeah. spread this to people and and change their lives in the way this changed mine like i was in a position where i didn't love myself at all like mm-hmm. i had, i didn't think i was useful um it, it was an awful position yeah. and i found love for myself and I found value for myself through hunting. I found that I'm, I can work really hard and be good at this. And other people noticed that like, it didn't matter that no one else in my area hunted. and I didn't have any friends that hunted. It's like, this is what Jacob does. You know, right. I'm Jacob and this is what I do, you know? <laughs> and so, right. and so people like enjoyed that. They were like, that's, yeah. that's awesome. And I get people that have been friends for a long time or I've known since I was young and they're like, dude, I have no interest in hunting, but it's amazing to see you like mm-hmm. doing what you love every day. And that's just what I hope to pass on to people. And I think what we've talked about so much in this is the things, and I think you can relate to this, um, the things that we do in our lives and the things we put time into, it's not necessarily because we love it or we love every bit of suffering in it. It's we use them as lessons and we use them as vehicles to become better men. 100%. And I think that we can use them as vehicles to encourage others to do the same and encourage others to push on through whatever they're going through. And hunting in public land, you know, is not nearly as glamorous as what 
a lot of other situations are. Mm-hmm. But we're in this the hardest way that we can so that we can better ourselves. And it doesn't matter whether you fail or succeed to become better. That's why, you know, it doesn't change your perception of yourself to kill a booner. A booner on the ground on public land is like about as good as it gets. But nice. like, you know, it doesn't change your perception of yourself because this is that's not the goal. The goal is to become a better man. And you were doing that the entire time. And you're taking the victories as that one percent you gained every day. Mm-hmm. And I just think that's so important for people to realize is that when you start caring about the little things in the day to day, the success comes, but mm-hmm. then the success isn't everything. That's yeah. when the success matters less to you. Yeah, exactly. Man, that was so well said. I think that that's the perfect way to kind of wrap this, this episode up. Um, before I let you get out of here though, let people know where they can watch, uh, the video of your Ohio buck, the video of your Wisconsin buck, and just, you know, where they can get a hold of you on online and, and check out what you got going on. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so my YouTube channel is the wild calling. Uh, I've made some stuff for the hunting beast in the past too. So if you want to see some past hunts, it's on there, but, uh, the wild calling, I have all of my hunts and whatnot and it's wild calling outdoors on Instagram, the wild calling on Facebook. I'll just basically update you on what's going on day to day, but the YouTube's where most of the stuff's happening. Awesome brother. Well, Hey man, I appreciate you coming on. It's been a pleasure having you on. You have an open invite to come back whenever you want. <laughs> You're the type of people I like to surround myself with, man. You know, hard workers, people who have the right perspective. Um, and dude, I'll just be honest with you, man. I'm stoked to see what you do in the next 10, 15 years, man. You got a, you got a fan right here, brother. Thanks, man. Hey, likewise, Clint. I'm very, very happy to be a part of this and have you as a friend. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. And before I shut this thing down, we need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Osseo Gear, Tethered, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Genesee Beer. And until next time, we'll see y'all.